You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I'm here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. So uh, I showed you, I, I, I showed you a a comment that a YouTuber had made about our show, and what did you what did you have any? I, nothing more than what I expected. He was disappointed that I wasn't more prominently featured uh, and identified as such. Uh, so he canceled his subscription. He resubscribed, and, though. And then he went looking for me yeah. elsewhere and found me, and through finding me elsewhere, found a connection to this, and so he came back and resubscribed. So thank you very much for mm-hmm. your comment and your diligence and your pursuit of excellence. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hang on a second. I'm going to come over there. Uh oh. No, no, I'm not. I'm, no, 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 it's not going to be. I'm going to. Are you going to cut this off or? No. What are we doing? You mess with it every week. You going to start over now? No, I just want to be able to hear you good. Well. Well, what? Well, hear, <laughs> hear me well, you dummy. Yeah. I know. But anyway, no, that's that's much better. Oh, good. It was easier for me oh, to well. just stand up and turn the mic than it was to say, hey, turn the mic a little bit. All right. Yeah. Well, you're a professional. Perfectionist. Professional perfectionist. Right. One, one hopes. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, really happy to get that comment, and I hope that that made you happy. You know, life makes me happy. Yeah. Life in, in general. Yeah. I am in life review. A five-year uh, terminal decline before you die? Well, okay. So, yeah. So, I'm not in life review because, no, I'm not in the, the uh, last five years hopes. of my life. Um, not that we know of, anyway. But I e- either because of circumstance or because of age or a combination, which I think it's probably a combination, Yeah, I'm in a position to really look at some things about me that I've always been aware of, but I thought were immutable and thinking, oh, maybe I could actually do something about those. So in particular, what I've realized is that a lot of the anger and fear that I have is a result of my family of origin upbringing, which is the case for most people. And I've always thought, oh, I don't know what I could do to really combat that. But now I'm at an age where I feel like maybe there is something that I can do. And so I'm actively trying to work on that. And hence the topic of letting go. How do you let go of these things from your past that just feel insurmountable? There's not a single quick and easy answer to that question. You develop uh, self-awareness from infancy based on the feedback from your environment and from your significant others. How they respond to you when you are upset, how they respond to you when you need or want, when you're afraid. If they smile when you come in the room, if they make eye contact, if they ignore you when you're trying to get their attention. I mean, all those things come into Mm self-awareness and then you develop skills to try to manipulate your environment to get more of what you want out of it and so you learn to espouse a political philosophy that echoes what you're you're taught in your home or in your community me tooism yeah i'm like that i'm that way don't you make me doesn't that make you happy um when to take risk, what kind of risk to take, and you ride the waves of emotional surges, uh, anxiety, fear, happiness, joy, whatever, in directions that are allowed by the frame in which you live. Mm -hmm. So then life goes on, and you continue to use those skills to address Mm -hmm. your current environment, and and sometimes life repositions your environment. You, You 
lose your job, you lose your house, you have to move somewhere else, you get a job, you move somewhere else, you go to school, you improve your educational standing, your availability of the marketplace changes, you, so, so life changes. And as it changes, you are still trying to massage it based on the lessons that you learned mm -hmm. and the skills that you developed in response to that. You have always argued in these conversations that your biggest concern as a therapist is teaching people how to moderate their anger. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, an essential survival skill. If you don't learn how to do that, if you don't learn how to deal with your anger, then you're going to get jammed in the face more regularly by life. And I, I think that that is the crux of my current, the horns of my yeah. current dilemma, yeah. is I've too. always said that I want to help people with emotional regulation in particular to moderate their anger. And what I'm wondering now is because I always assumed the anger that resides within a person from those family of origin issues is immutable. And now I am wondering if that is true. Is it, can a person change their personality? Yes, I believe that they can. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's what therapy offers an opportunity for if, if you're in a place where you can hear that and you wish to pursue it. Um, anger is original issue equipment. It's one of our fundamental mm -hmm. emotions. Babies are, are, are born being angry about things. All of us have anger. One of the questions in our society and in every society is how do you learn to display, moderate, resolve anger surges. Mm -hmm. What are the, can you identify the things that make you angry and avoid those? Can you identify the things that make you angry and find ways to interact with those things that make it more successful for you, a better outcome for you? Uh, you may find that avoidance is a better answer. I'm going to leave my family of origin mm -hmm. behind. I'm going to not talk to them anymore. I won't go to family reunions. They're not any, they're dead to me. I'm moving on. Uh, that's one way to do it. But what I have learned is that you then go and create a new environment and a new family in your life, and you act out mm -hmm. the scripts that you learned in early childhood, whether they, whether you're projecting it onto people for whom or for which that's not an accurate inter interpretation of those people. You're projecting onto them that they are behaving the way that those in your original family behaved or that they're thinking the way those people think or that they want from you what those people wanted and you start dancing that dance it's just unfinished business mm -hmm. uh, we used to do marriage uh, counseling based on that premise that your um, imago is trying to resolve the unfinished business from your uh, interaction with your parents uh, that still plays out in your life right and and i think that's true I think that that is a big motivation for where what I am experiencing comes from yeah. is replaying those scripts. So whether it's transactional analysis or imago theory, I mean, they, they're really talking about the same thing. You're just replaying the same right. unresolved but issues. But from the standpoint of the skills that you learned. So if you learned to, when you were threatened, when you were hurt, when you were angry, if you learned to be aggressive, Verbally aggressive, physically aggressive, uh, physically active in some way, getting a fist fight, push people around, that that got you out of that immediate moment, mm -hmm. then your tendency is to surrender to those skill sets once again whenever you're challenged. Mm -hmm. If you learn to be seductive and cute and funny and use your sense of humor whenever you are threatened, then you become the jokester and you're mm -hmm. always trying to alleviate circumstances to put you in the best light with your humor. Right. Uh, so you learn fundamental skill sets that become an integral part of your presentation to the world. Can you change that? Do you want to? I, if the answer is, do you want to, then I would say to you, yes, you can. You have mm -hmm. to learn how. Mm -hmm. And what I always told my clients is once you reach the point where you can consciously make a choice on how you want to behave in response to certain stimuli, I choose to be this person, to respond this way to an insult to my ego or an insult to my existence. Um, as long as you're thinking about mm -hmm. it and choosing to act that way, you can do so. But if you go on autopilot and if you behave reflexively, the old script kicks in mm -hmm. and you do the things that worked in that original environment but may not 
work in this new environment. Right. And and my conceptualization has always been I can teach you skill sets that will help you moderate that anger mm -hmm. and help you deal more effectively in 99% of your interactions, but that's still going to be a core part of you. And, and now I'm wondering, is that true? Is that, is that as immutable as I've always thought it was, or can you let go of those old scripts and stop being subservient to them? And I don't know if that's because now at almost 60 years old, my body is changing hormonally. I don't know if it's because uh, I'm more introspective, more mindful. Maybe I've learned enough psychology that I'm now seeing this differently, but I'm starting to believe that it may be possible to let go of those scripts. I've always believed that it's possible to do that. Uh, I think it's a challenge and I think it's hard, hard work, mm -hmm. but I think I think you have to believe in that potential progress or you're doomed. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so do you think that a person can just wake up one morning and say, okay, I'm going to do this and then endeavor to, to, to walk the path? Or do you think that you have to face some kind of significant life crisis that puts you in that position? Do you understand what I'm saying? I think so. I think in my experience significant progress towards change mm -hmm. comes out of a significant threat environment. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's true experience. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, otherwise, you don't have the uh, the drive. Yeah. You don't have so I would say that that's actually, that significant life event has to be enough to undermine maybe even the underpinnings of what you th what your identity is. Yeah. And that when that happens, then you have a choice. Uh, it's like, you know, coming to a crossroads and you can take the old path and just use the old habits and the old ways of coping, or you can at that point forge a new path. And I think that in so doing, you may be able to find a way to resolve. Okay. So let me ask this question. Do you resolve the unresolved information or do you just find a way to let it go and not let it trouble you? Um, or you paint it green and call it something else, but it's the same experience. You just put a new label on it. Uh, okay. Interpret okay. it that way. I, I can hear that. Um, I think going back to classic psychoanalytic theory, there are a couple of concepts. One is a flight into sickness and one is mm -hmm. a repetition compulsion. Yeah. And I think when you get to, uh, an opportunity or a circumstance that, offers you a chance to restructure your life, whether you've even sought it out or whether it just intruded on you. You had a car wreck and you lost your legs. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's an opportunity that life presents you to change those things that you might wish to change. But I think most of us reflexively just do different day, same crap. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we, we try to continue to survive with the survival skills that we learned. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to, to step back and say, well, wait a minute, there is another way. There may be, there are other ways. Mm -hmm. And some of them might be better. Uh, am I willing to explore that? Mm -hmm. And I think we, we resist it because we want to dance the rhythm that we know, that we've internalized. It's part of who we are. But again, is that a resolution no to the unresolved or no, is an it opportunity just, so so it's a restructuring of how you conceptualize the unresolved information yeah for instance when yeah. i was teaching psychology in high school i used to talk to my students about how we become so habituated physically and mentally to the circumstances of our life mm -hmm. that we don't think about many of those things and so one of the things that i would challenge to do is um uh, Lay your clothes out the night before you go to bed that you're going to wear tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Put them all out where you know where they are and what you've made your selections. Then when you wake up in the morning, don't open your eyes. Get up and go mm -hmm. to the bathroom. 
brush your teeth, shave if you need to shave, take a shower, whatever you need to do, come back, get dressed. Put the clothes on no matter never open what. your eyes uh -huh. and pay attention to how you get dressed. Mm -hmm. Most of us become so habituated that we always, if we put our pants on first, we always put our pants on first. Mm -hmm. If we put our left leg mm -hmm. in first, mm -hmm. we always put our left leg in first. So then I would say once mm -hmm. you are focused on that, try to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Put your right leg in first. Mm -hmm. Put your shirt on first. See that you are aware of that and see what that feels like. Mm -hmm. You always put your wallet in your left hip pocket, put it in your right hip pocket. Mm -hmm. you know, and see how that intrudes on your consciousness. Wait a minute, that's different. I'm not comfortable. I can't relax. Right. Well, you're going to be uncomfortable. You are. Use that discomfort to cognitively process are there things that if I did differently mm -hmm. would bring me different results? If mm -hmm. I approach studying in school, if I approach being an employee at work differently, mm -hmm. interacting with my coworkers differently, does that promote change in a direction that I want to go? So let's go to our break, and when we come back, I'm going to ask you a question. Right. One of the reasons that I want to participate in this show is because it gives me an opportunity to clinically review my understanding of what therapy is and how it works, especially for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that we will find conversations that broaden my understanding of that. And my hope is that we do that in a way that is useful, but also entertaining for people so that they want to listen, not only because they're getting good psychology information, but because they just enjoy the show. Easy listening with an informational twist. So That's a new tagline. They're not sitting there going, huh? Easy listening with an informational twist. I'm really good at it. I'm a professional. You're here. a professional. If it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. And and so uh, you're talking about establishing a different pattern. From, pattern. from a point of awareness. Yeah. Awareness yeah. of opportunity. I now have an opportunity to be different. Do I want to? Um, right. And you know what? Many times I'm like, hell no, I'm real happy where I am. But then if life continues to deteriorate, I have to say, well, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not either A, aware or B, honest. Right. But, but so let's assume we, we, we establish a different habituated pattern, right. which is more, uh, you know, life enhancing or, or whatever it's better. Yeah. And, and so that doesn't necessarily resolve those old issues, no. but may, may, uh, uh, paint them in a different light. So yes. do I see them differently then going forward? You know, that's what the military teaches. What, in an era when most young men were going into military service, the military would take them and try to break mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. then recreate them in the way that they wanted them to be. And they promoted the idea that discipline, mm -hmm. externally imposed discipline or self-imposed discipline, is at the core of progress. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to discipline yourself. I, I decide I don't want to... Uh, I, I don't want to eat the foods that I've been eating because they're impacting my health in ways that I don't want it to. I'm putting right. on weight. Right. I'm having blood pressure problems. I'm having heart conditions. I'm having whatever. So I need to eat differently. My subconscious, my id, is going to continue to say, wait, wait, you know, you want gravy on that. You want cheese and butter mm -hmm. on that. You know, mm -hmm. Something sweet is really good. You should a little more hurt you. You know, what's that? And, you, you know, right now I want the immediate gratification. So you have to delay, you have mm -hmm. to learn to delay gratification mm -hmm. in pursuit of a goal. So you set a goal and then you discipline yourself to try to achieve that goal. If your goal is to change your fundamental picture or image of yourself or the way life works, I always lose, I always get screwed over, they always destroy me. Then you have to change that roadmap mm -hmm. or it's always going to happen. It's mm -hmm. that repetition compulsion. Mm -hmm. That's why the you know, data shows a woman that marries an alcoholic. Right. Marries nine times out of yeah. ten, she won't divorce him just because he's an alcoholic. If she divorces him, it may be because he abuses the children or because economically you know, she can't support him and her kids and herself. You know, so. But then when she marries again, Nine times out of ten, she marries another alcoholic. Mm -hmm. She's the most surprised person in the room. She says, oh, my God, I checked it out. He wasn't drinking. He wasn't that. It just, how, how did I get to this place mm -hmm. again? And that'll happen two, three times. That's why uh, 
addiction treatment protocols don't work for most people three, four, five times. Mm -hmm. It takes six or more yeah. of going through treatment before they finally are able to stop the addictive uh, process mm -hmm. for the particular chemical that they're addicted to mm -hmm. or behavior that they're addicted to. So I, I think it takes self-discipline. I think it takes self-awareness. I think it takes determination. Uh, if you just reflexively, you know, if, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Mm -hmm. We used to say that as a, as a mantra to our clients. Right. And so uh, where I'm at right now in this process is that I have identified some behaviors that I'm working on to construct different the, habitual Behaviors patterns. or attitudes? Well, the, the behaviors, because my, my thinking is, so just let's take driving as an example. Hmm. So I'm a horrible, I'm not a horrible driver. I'm, uh, I'm an Impatient, impatient driver. Yes, yeah, I was going to say discourteous, uh, and and you know just get so angry at the ineptitude of what I see as all the other drivers who are really bad, and so I'm trying to focus on that. And when I recognize that that is welling up in me, I get angry or afraid of you know this person's going to come rage reaction yeah then i'm i'm saying oh you know what no let's deal differently with that and i've been in in the process of this for probably 30 years trying to work on on exactly this issue but i feel closer to it now closer to a uh, some breakthrough or epiphany and i i don't know why that's different but it feels different and it really feels like I actually could get to a point where I drive differently with a different attitude because I have practiced different responsive behaviors. Does that sound right? Well, I don't know. Uh, it sounds encouraging. So my question is, I think what I'm hesitating over, mm -hmm. that is an example which to me is not comprehensive reflection of who you are mm -hmm. and how do you interact with life. Mm -hmm. It's an example. If you identify that as an area where progress can be made mm -hmm. and you make that progress, it's still additive to the overall way you present yourself in life. Ah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So maybe you perceive yourself and others perceive you as a more courteous driver and you are mm -hmm. less frustrated as you drive. Does that translate into saying, well, you're less frustrated in life right. and you handle other frustrations differently mm -hmm. than you once did? Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I assuming as you talk that that would be your goal. It is. And, 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 and it feels like I could answer that question in the affirmative. It feels like to me that working on this issue is translating into that deeper goal. And I don't know why, because like I said, I... Yeah, I and I would say to you, it can't just okay. be magical that way. It has to be more deliberate and intentional as a way to interact with life, as a way to present yourself across your spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, being a more courteous driver is an ingredient, and it may be a significant one, an opportunistic one that mm -hmm. you can seize upon, but it has to more globalize or it won't hold against the force of that inertia from your lifetime. Right, but could the deeper process be playing out and, and the driving is just Not the invisibly. outward manifestation? Y yes. So I would encourage you to look and see if there mm -hmm. are other examples. Like if you're in the line at the grocery store mm -hmm. and some bozo cuts in front of you because obviously they're important or they're in a right. hurry or they whatever, uh, can you have a similar reaction? Can that you exact same thing. That exact thing happened. Okay. And and yes. And, and well, it, so then I would say to you that. And when it happened, and I wasn't thinking this way when it happened, but when it happened, I recognized, oh, because you're working on the driving, it's actually having a spillover Moderating effect. Influence. Yeah. And it's, and, it's, and it's affecting these other interactions as well. So, yes, that happened. And I didn't make that connection to what you're saying. But, Mike, I'm a professional. Yeah, you're I a do professional. this for a living. I've That's been right. doing it for 35 years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I've always wanted to be you. I know. I know. Many me. <laughs>
So, so you would say then that you can foundationally change those personalities because you know we've always talked about you know Kernberg and uh, Kohut and all those guys that we liked in the very early days of psychodynamic theory, and that was a real issue for a lot of those theoreticians was is your personality permanent and immutable or is it changeable and different people different theorists had different conceptualizations of that my conceptualization has always been more like it's it's pretty fixed but now i'm almost 60 years old and i'm starting to think mm, maybe it's not and so maybe it never was i don't think that you ever have more than a snapshot Mm, we're, that's a good we're point. too limited yeah, that's in good our point. perspective. Yeah. So I am more aware in the immediate moment of what I, uh, I can be more aware of what I feel, mm -hmm. but if I've gotten through most of life by learning not to feel, not to let my consciousness know my feelings, yeah. then I still tend to do that. Yeah. So if I want that to change and I want to be more aware of well, what do I actually feel, when people would ask me, what do you feel? And I would say, I don't know. Or I would say nothing, mm -hmm. which to me was an honest answer mm -hmm. because I had not developed the introspection to identify my feelings. Right. So what would happen in my life is that there would be observable behaviors from which others could interpret what I was feeling and would, and they would apply those interpretations. And I would look and go, I, I, why are you saying that? You know, mm -hmm. I don't see that. I don't, you can't be right. I eventually had to be selective in who was interpreting me to me mm -hmm. oh yeah absolutely and selective in my willingness to hear what right. they were saying and then be introspective and and that is such a great point and something that we go over that i have used in in my therapy practice and i tell people you know i would never personally there are three people in my life that i actually would listen to because I trust them implicitly and maybe actually for, uh, and I don't think that they would ever say anything to me from their own motivation. They would only say it to, to be helpful and supportive of me. And I don't think that people should have, you shouldn't open that up to the population at large. You shouldn't be responsive to what the population thinks of you, but everybody needs a couple people that can see them genuinely and honestly, and that they can hear the reflections from and be able to at least think about it. That doesn't mean you should automatically change your behavior, but you should at least think about is what this person is saying relevant to me in a way that I want to use to change myself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is super, super important. And I don't know if people really identify, oh, this is a person that I can feel that way about. Well, I don't know if they stop and think. I mean, uh, here's a rabbit, chase this rabbit. So you, off you go. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You have to say, wait a minute, I'm to move for a rabbit. Do I want it? What do I want? If I get that rabbit, what do I want to do with it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, are others driving the bus? I, when I work with adolescents, I used to talk to them all the time about their anger, about adults telling them what to do. And life tell them what to do. And I would say, you are in the back seat of the car of your life. Mm -hmm. Other people have been mm -hmm. driving you since you were born. They take you everywhere you go. They show you everything you can see and give you everything that you can have. At some point, part of growing up is getting in the driver's seat. But then you have to be responsible for where the car goes. Right. So if you want to be in control of your life, get in the driver's seat, right. but be aware that you have to pay the cost. And if you end up someplace that, that you, you shouldn't be, you can't say, oh, well, it's not my it's fault. It's not my fault. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you want to drive your life, get in the driver's seat, take off. And so to, to close out, I'm going to ask you a question. Obviously, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but uh, you didn't go to therapy for a long time. You actually resisted it yeah. for a long time. And then you went, when you went, did you feel like that it reformatted your perception of your identity or did you feel like that it was helpful and instructional but just helped you maybe knock off some rough edges so one of the reasons that i resisted going to therapy myself was because 
I was a therapist mm-hmm. and I didn't trust myself to go to therapy and not play head games mm-hmm. with my opponent. Uh, so in order to go to therapy, I had to reach a place where I was willing to monitor myself and supervise myself and not do that. So I made the commitment when I started therapy to my wife, to myself, to my therapist, I won't escape from whatever I need to face here Mm -hmm. by playing head games with you about how smart I am. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do that. And because I had made that self-disciplined decision in pursuit of a goal that I chose, I think I was able to discover some things that I wanted to find out and Mm -hmm. try to change some behaviors that I wanted to change. So it was foundational for but, you. But it wasn't the going to therapy that was foundational. It was the decision yeah. that yeah, yeah. if I went, I could control myself uh, differently. Gotcha. Ooh, okay. I see where you're coming from. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. So that decision mm-hmm. was foundational. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's very because, because my natural defense is to fall back into... The manipulations that I've learned to survive around yeah. all my life. Yeah. I use those to protect me uh, or to promote my own agenda, whatever that happens to be. Well, that was a fantastic clinical discussion here on Psych with Brett. And <laughs> what we would like for people to do is to find us on the interwebs. So go to the YouTubes and find Psych with Mike and subscribe to the show. That is super beneficial. And anybody who hears this message, I am asking you to do that without delay because you'll forget. So do it right now. The other thing you can do is to find us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a comment because that really helps other people find the show. And we really, really Really, really appreciate that. The music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.